Welcome to Expressions, the quintessential podcast from the New Indian Express Group. We are here to talk about all things life and lifestyle, and we will be touching upon topics like wellness, relationships, parenting, mental health, general health, and happiness. We hope to discover the extraordinary in the ordinary as our expert guests provide you with various insights and life hacks for successful, harmonious, and holistic living. Our conversations will help you choose wisely and will encourage you to set yourself up for success and provide you with positive and encouraging content for personal growth and development as we learn from the lives of others. Welcome to Expressions. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Expressions podcast. We have a very special guest with us today. We have with us Raj Ganpat. Hi. He is the co-founder of Quad, a fitness coach, trainer, entrepreneur, all rolled into one fit package. Thank you so much, Raj, for making the time. We have with us today our host, Neha Suntalia, director of uh, Event Express, and I'm your co-host, Edison Thomas. Welcome, Raj, to Expressions, and we're really happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, too. Uh, so what led you to fitness? How did it all start? Well, it's... Um, long story, I'll try and keep it short. Um, I was not fit growing up at all. Okay? I was actually uh, quite a sick child, um, wasn't able to play any kind of sport. Um, by the age of 10, I want to say, uh, I was diagnosed with um, asthma and acute sinusitis. I didn't know what these things were back then. So from then on, for the entirety of my childhood, um, I wasn't someone who was very active. I couldn't really run, especially run. Right? So the only sport I play was cricket because, you know, you can get away with things, right? You, you can have a bite on her back in the day. So um, I did play a lot, but more like this, but I was never athletic. And this continued on for a very long time. And in fact, one of my earliest memories of this is when I was actually 10 and I was um, in a karate class in school. And I don't know if you guys remember, back then everyone had to go to karate yeah. class, right? So why? And I didn't realize karate class had running involved. Running was a nemesis, right? So went to class and I was asked to run a couple of rounds and it was, a, uh, it was basically a small ground which I was running around and I started feeling something. At that point, I didn't know I had asthma. So I just started feeling something and I found it hard to breathe and it got worse. And over a period of time, I just couldn't breathe and I was just gasping for breath and I was embarrassed. I started crying and I just sat down just on the curb and I was just bawling and unable to breathe. Um, at that point, I remember seeing a pair of shoes, like familiar pair of shoes. I look up and it's my dad, right? And made me feel even more embarrassed because again, I d was not diagnosed at that point of time, right? So that was, my, that was my first memory of how hard it was to run. And that continued for a very long time. It went on um, during school, during college, when I did my master's, especially when I did my master's because I did my master's in New Jersey. Um, and temperature was very cold. So at all at different points of time, I had these asthma attacks. And to me, it was very clear that sport, running, athleticism, not for you. So I learned to live around that. And that continued. And I did my master's. I got a job. Um, and initially, I was a kind of poor graduate student. So weight gain was not a problem because you don't really have as much food. But then once I got a job, and I moved to California at that point of time, and you have some money, so you start eating well. And as you guys can imagine, the portion sizes in the US are huge, and you learn to eat them. So by the age of about 24, 23, 24, I was significantly overweight. And I didn't realize that, because why would you? Because you're just enjoying life, you're just eating, and things like that. And around the age of 25, I went through a really tough time in life, at work, personal life, and as it usually is at that age, some kind, something to do with love and da -da -da, whatever, <laughs> right? And I remember, um, in fact, I remember very clearly, I was in my room and I was just walking and there's this mirror in my room and I just caught a glance of myself and I remember thinking, that doesn't look like me. Looks like you've completely lost the plot because I was just really pushing myself down that downward spiral, right? Things were just going badly and I was eating badly, you know, just bad lifestyle habits, everything was off. And I made a decision at that point, and this is a memory I very clearly have, that I said, what if I can use all this energy, this negative energy, this emotion, this angst, this depression, 
can I use that to create a better version of myself? As opposed to you know, pushing myself down that spiral even further. And that's kind of how all this started. And the thing that I wanted to tackle was running. Because I could never run. If I ran for more than a few minutes, I would have an asthma attack, and this was a given. And I would have a, uh, an inhaler with me all the time, and I have multiple instances where this has happened. So that's when I started, and I said, I'm going to run. So the very next day, I said, I'm going to run. I didn't even have running shoes. It was just these random, good-looking sport shoes, if you know what I mean. Um, picked those, decided to run at 9 p.m. at night. Um, California, not too cold, still cold for Chennai standards, of course, but uh, not too cold, so I can do that. But it was at night because no one can see me and I wouldn't be embarrassed. So I started running. I lasted 100 meters. At the end of 100 meters, I had an asthma attack. I had to sit down on the curb, get my inhaler out, and take a couple of puffs. The only difference was this time I said, I'm not giving up. I'm going to wait till this subsides and I'm going to run again. And I ran again. And in another 100 to 200 meters, I had another attack. I had another puff. Then I said, I'm going to keep going again. So I think I covered about 500 to 600 meters. It took me, I want to say, about 30 to 40 minutes with multiple attacks. That was my first venture into fitness or any kind of running right, that, I, that I voluntarily did. But then I did realize that if I can do this regularly, this would get better. And so I did it every night without any expectations of myself. And within a couple of months, I was able to run nine miles um, in a hill race, and I was able to complete that. Oh, so that's inspiring. That's kind of how it started. And it, and it was mind-blowing. I mean, I inspired myself, right, <laughs> if you can think about it. Because I didn't think I could ever do it. All my life, I've struggled with this, and I realized that if I could do it, then there are so many people who could do it too. So this is how I got into fitness per se, personal fitness, and it was all running. And I ran and ran and ran, and I, and I loved running, you know, the runner's high, the endorphins, right, all that. And it got to a point where I had to run five miles a day, right, from not being able to run at all, right, to that. And I was consistently running about 100 kilometers a week, regularly, right, and that was normal. And I had an injury. I had uh, plantar fasciitis for the first time, and I couldn't run. And I was so angry because I couldn't do any kind of exercise, which basically means I'm not getting that runner side, I'm not getting any of it. And that's when I realized, if I want to be fit, I can't be a one-trick pony. I can't just run. So if you can't run, then you can't do anything else. And that is what kind of got me started um, with skill acquisition. Yeah. I had to learn more skills to use a dumbbell, to do body weight work, to do a barbell, right? So I started learning more and more. And as I was doing that, I got this interest in fitness. I wanted to learn more about it. I want to understand the why. Why is this working? Why is that not working? And mind you, I hadn't even gotten into nutrition at that point of time. It was just fitness. Right? What about your asthma? Did it just go away? Yeah. Great question. So what happened was it didn't go away. I learned how to manage it. I mean, I still had the inhaler. I would, I would take a couple of puffs before I started the run, right? And gradually, say the first time, I lost 100 meters, but over a period of time, it became 200, 300. I was able to run a kilometer, right? It, and then by about a mile, mile and a half, I'll have an attack. But slowly, endurance helps, mm. right? But the condition was still there. I hadn't fixed it, so to speak. But it was very interesting for me, and so I wanted to learn more about fitness. And I was looking around, I was just doing some self-reading, and... Um, I mean, I, I, I was an engineer, right? I did my undergrad at Bitspilani and then I did my master's in New Jersey. So I'm a trained engineer in the sense that I'm trained in solving problems, right? That's what fix you do. Things. Yeah, fix things. So this was a problem and I figured I could solve it. I knew how to read research papers, right? I could understand them. So I got into research, started looking into, you know, I was spending a lot of time in PubMed trying to look at why this happens, why it helps with that data. And then I realized that the, the best way to actually learn is to get a certification. Not just random reading here and there. Self-learning is good. But if I have to have structured knowledge about the subject, being someone who's, a, who's very new to the field, I thought I'll get a certification. So I looked into that, and I thought, how about I get my first certification? And I studied for it. it um, these certifications are not easy, especially if you haven't studied for a long time, right? Like you've been out of college for a while. So it took me about two to three months. Um, spent, uh, I was working obviously during the day and at night as soon as I came home I'd spend two to three hours in a room just sitting and studying and I was so engaged and so interested. I've never been this engaged or interested when it comes to studies, right? This was exciting for me. I didn't want to stop and I went and wrote the exam and I aced it. 
It's like, I'm not a great student, <laughs> right? I'm a good student, okay, but I'm not a great student. I was shocked, I'm like, how come I ace this? And that's when I realized, you know, people keep saying, you know, you're calling, you know, something you're meant to do, purpose, all that. I'm like, maybe this is what that feels like. And that kind of got me deeper into study. And that's when I got into nutrition. And I realized nutrition was a whole other world. It's not just exercise, that's just one bit of this whole fitness health thing. Nutrition is humongous. And I started learning nutrition, started reading nutrition, looking at you know, different sides, you know, people who agree with me, people who disagree with me, my opinions, research, right, and getting certifications. And in fact, that is how I tackled asthma. What I realized at that point was that I was allergic to a lot of things that I was eating. Right? It, a part of it was gluten, part of it was dairy. So I experimented with different kinds of eating. I went grain free for a whole bunch of, you know, for about six to nine months. I worked on gluten free diets. I did um, basically diets that you do for autoimmune conditions. I try out, tried out various different options. And to my surprise, what couldn't be cured for 25 years of my life, which is, you know, asthma, was just gone. Wow. Wow. Right. And that was a light bulb moment in my head. I'm like, I did not realize that you could improve your health yeah. without medicines. Mind you, 25 years ago, this was not common knowledge. Right? If you're not well, you go to a doctor. And I'd been to a doctor, allopathy, I mean, homeopathy, even the fish with the pill and you drop it in, right? All that, but nothing really worked. So to me, I would said that this is gonna be a part of my life. So when nutrition was able to fix it, that was a light bulb and to me it was like, if this could help me so much, I'm sure this can help so many people, right? And that was a time, uh, back then in India, fitness was about three days of strength work or, or not even, you know, dumbbell, barbell kind of bodybuilding type work and three days of cardio and you're doing a low fat diet. This was the recipe, it was, the, it was what was done in every gym by every trainer for everyone, whoever you were, right? You do 20 minutes treadmill, 20 minute elliptical, 20 minute cycle, right? So when I read this and I realized that there was such a big gap. And that's when I realized, okay, this is probably where I can contribute. This is where I can be useful, right? And that's what started this whole process of personal fitness and how the quad came about. And when I met my co-founder, Arvind, who was in his own journey at that point of time and our visions kind of, you know, matched almost perfectly. And then we decided that we want to move to India and start the quad. So long answer, no. but they're all connected. But really yeah. nice and very interesting to know. Uh, so talking about your qualifications, where did you do this uh, fitness and nutrition? Huh. So, so uh, my first certification was a fitness certification. So, yeah. so the way um, fitness works, say that there are obviously many ways to get certified. One way is to actually go to college. Uh -huh. You can go to college, get a four year degree, right? It could be outside India, in India. Uh, another way to go about it is to obviously get certified in different aspects of fitness. So irrespective of uh, what your specialization is, you need to get the base certification, which is you know, a personal fitness trainer. And this is offered by many um, agencies, so to speak, right? You have um, NCAA, you have uh, ACE, you have Nesta, you have so many different uh, bodies. And obviously there is an overall certifying body, which makes sure that these organizations which are uh, certifying you are doing it as per the right syllabus. Mm -hmm. So my first certification was through Nesta. And the reason I picked Nesta was because I was still working at that point of time. So Nesta was um, a computer adaptive test, okay. like, like, like your GRE. In yeah. fact, when I went to take my Nesta, there were a lot of people writing GRE, right, right there. <laughs> and that took me back to when I wrote my GRE, right? So, so that was my first certification. And it requires uh, two to three months of studying. And then you go and write the examination. It's not an easy exam, so to speak. But once you clear that, then you can add other things on top of it. Okay. So my second certification was on nutrition because I was very interested in nutrition. Um, I still am and I can't stop studying nutrition, right? So that was my next certification. But from there on, I, was, I started experimenting with myself, different training programs, different diets. And that's when I was introduced to the different coaches in the fitness world. And I was in the US back then, mind you, right? So then, and after I met Arvind, so, and we decided that we wanted to do something about it. We said we were going to meet all these coaches. And I'm talking about Mark Ripito, Dan John, right? I mean, this was a time when CrossFit was coming up. Mm -hmm. So we went around the country, the US, and we met different coaches and you got did? certified by a wow. lot of them. Yeah. So because we had decided at that point of time, we were going to come back to India and we were going to start this. Right? And we realized that once we're here, we're not going to be able to get access to these coaches as easily. 
So we are there for the next couple of years. So both of us, we decided that, okay, I will do these certifications, you do these certifications, because together, yeah. right, we can cover a lot more. Yeah, and so we met so many coaches, we spent hours with them, and that's how we got our certifications. But the thing with fitness and certifications is that all these certifications expire. You have to renew them. You have to keep them current, mm -hmm. right? So up until today, if you are someone who's coaching at the quad, you need to have an active certification in addition to what the quad does to certify you know, its own coaches. So we have our own certification program also. But outside of that, you need to have a proper valid certification. These certifications can last anywhere from one year to four years, depending on which one you pick. But you can either renew them by writing them again, or you do other certifications. You know, basically CEUs, you get credit units, and this gets renewed. So it's a never-ending process, learning as such. Um, unlike the engineering bit where you go to college and then you're like, I'm done with studying. Now it's working only. Here it is about constantly updating yourself with what is out there. Because that's the thing with research. Something new is coming up all the time. And what you thought was true yesterday is probably not true anymore. Yeah. 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 So education is, is, is a part of life. How old were you when you did this? The, my first certification, I think I was 27, 28. Um, started much later, like I said. First half of my life was all you know, engineering. I was in the medical device field. Mm -hmm. So I was actually in research and development. Okay. My, my first, the first company I worked with, we were making neurovascular implants, basically implants for the brain. And I was the uh, designer, right? Research and development engineer for that. And from there, I moved on to endovascular, basically implants for the heart. So I had a medical device background. Yeah. Right. Fitness, though, it is, it, is, it is not the same. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of physiology, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of anatomy which translates from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Right. And how uh, supportive were your family uh, towards... Extremely. Yeah. Extremely. I mean... Can you talk about a little more? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in so many ways, right? I mean, and privileged in so many ways. And, and one of the main ways, I'd say, is my family. Both my parents, my mom and dad, I'm the only child. Um, so after I finished my schooling here, I went to Don Bosco here. Then I went to Pilani, Bits Pilani. And from there, I went to the US to do my master's. So all this was on the engineering line. And naturally, right, they had supported me throughout this and sponsored me and all these things, right? I mean, college is not cheap here or there. Yeah. Uh, you get scholarships, you work part-time, all that, but still. Yeah. And at the end of all this, I was doing really well on the medical device side. I was working at Boston Scientific first, and then I worked uh, for three other startups. And in fact, the last startup I worked at was getting bought by another company called Endologix. So I was waiting for that to go through. So I'd get my, you know, I can cash out and then I can still do something. So basically everything was going well. And then I went and told my parents that I want to drop all of this. <laughs> and I want to start from scratch. Right? And they were nothing but supportive. From day one, they've always told me, both my mom and my dad, have always told me that you're passionate about something, you go for it. We are here to support you. There was not a single moment when they ever said, Think twice about it. You're already making so much money. You own this car. You own that. Why do you want to make this change? But it was not just then. Um, my wife now, then, was my girlfriend. She was. Uh, we were li living in California back then, and we were we, we we were in a relationship back then. We were not married yet. We were looking to get married, and the families were getting together. You know, different story. But all, while that was happening, me making a switch from a very um, how do I put this. Uh, fruitful career, so to speak, yeah. right? And very, very promising career because was, I was growing really well in the medical device industry also, right? And making a switch. In fact, there were, there were questions like, um, you know, if I could speak in Tamar a little bit, you know, there's stuntman out of you know? Because <laughs> fitness was not a thing back then. You don't give up your job in the US, you don't go do your masters and you come here and do, you know, fitness. Fitness was, when you think, you think about trainers who will come home and stretch you. That was how fitness was perceived in India and in Chennai, you know, back then. So when the switch was happening, it was very hard for her because she had to justify my switch too. So from then up until today, and by today, I mean this morning, right? uh, Vidya, my wife, she's been, she's been my pillar, right? I mean, she's always been supportive. And even when things did not go well, and as you know, as an entrepreneur, as in the fitness field, which is still very nascent, still very rudimentary, things go here and there, right? And at all points of time, she's not just supported me, she's believed in me. And she's always told me that, you know, we're just getting started, right? There's more to build. So that way I've been extremely lucky. And, and I spoke about family, but the 
other person, two people rather, who were very instrumental in this, in this journey was my co-founder and his now wife. So we're basically all friends. It's Arvind and Ranjini, right? They are a part of the quad right now. Arvind's obviously my co-founder. Ranjini heads business development. Um, and we, we did this together. We basically came up with the quad together. So we would meet in random coffee shops in California, talk about this, how to come up with it, right? So basically, without the support system, nothing's, nothing's going to happen, right? Like, I mean, there are a lot of people who say, I'm self-made. I don't believe anyone is self-made, right? Without, without the support and encouragement. And more importantly, even if you don't fail, knowing that you are protected from failure because all these people are there for you, that is the strength you need to you know, actually move forward, especially when you're young and stupid. You know, so, so yeah, definitely, I had so much support, and I'm, I'm ever grateful for that, yes. Yeah. And uh, what do you feel about sports? You, you spoke that you played cricket. Uh, do you still play any sports? And what do you have, what would you say about sports, cricket, Martial arts, Edison, you Mixed wanted. martial arts, and you know, is that yeah. is that a is that a way to fitness? Definitely, I'd say. Um, see, firstly, when we're talking about fitness, you're talking about exercise. What you want to remember is it's basically a smartly packaged way to get the kind of movement that you need. Yeah. See, back in the day when we we're hunter gatherers, right, many thousands of years ago. We used to run, jump, push, pull, climb, squat, do all yes. these things. You had to to survive. Right? Today we don't have to, so we don't do it. But your body still needs it because your body is still you know, stuck you know, thousands of years ago, hasn't caught up. So exercise is basically smartly packaging all of that. So when you say strength, speed, endurance, mobility, that's basically making sure you are using the body for what it is designed to do. So sport, martial art, dance, these things fit beautifully. Yeah, so when you're talking about sport, um, like I said, I, I always liked sport. I was just not able to play as well. Um, uh, the, the, the endurance was not there. The fitness was not there. Right? I, the interest was always there. I would, I would love to spend hours doing it, but my body just wouldn't let me do it. But much later on in life, when I got into fitness, I still didn't get into, get into sport. I would do a lot of fitness stuff because fitness was my sport. Hmm. Kettlebells was my, you know, they, they, they were my equipment and I was trying to get better at it and over and over and over again. But after a few years, I started getting into sport, like n nothing um, very serious or deep, but I love it when I play sport. A different side of me comes yeah. out, right? You, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's very different. So I've dabbled a little bit with Ultimate Frisbee, you know, a few years ago. I mean, n nothing major, but I like to throw, I like to run. And it's interesting because the reason I like sport was because... Previously, I loved sport, but fitness was a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, fitness is not a problem. I can just keep going. I'm not going to stop. Skill is the problem. And skill is great because it's nice to suck at something. And then you learn, right? And that, that's the best part. So um, then I started playing tennis a few years ago, loved it. Now I've uh, been bitten by the pickleball bug. Um, I played pickleball this morning for 90 minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's a great sport. Um, love playing it. I strongly recommend people play sport because one of the reasons um, sport is so cool, same thing applies to martial arts or dance, is that you exert yourself a lot. Right. Except you don't even realize it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're running after a ball or you're doing something, your heart rate's going up. It's not, it doesn't feel as laborious as exercise or as running. It's not like, oh, I'm done with 20 minutes, I have another 30 minutes on the elliptical. When you're playing sport, you don't realize time yeah, go by. Absolutely. Right? So you're jumping, you're pushing, you're pulling, you're doing all these things. So I think sport is a great way to do it. And it's a wonderful stress buster, especially today with so much, so many stressors in our lives. I think it's, it's great. So um, martial arts also, I've done a little bit of it, mixing martial arts. Um, again, nothing serious, but more with a fitness perspective. Works equally well. An hour of sport, say it could be tennis, badminton, table tennis, pickleball, football, cricket, or martial arts, or even dance or Zumba, all these things can burn as much as, say, running 10 to 12 kilometers in an hour. Wow. Which wow. is quite significant. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, usually you'll see people who are playing sport, right? They are actually very fit, like physically fit. They may not look it. That's because the nutrition side is missing. Oh. But you're still, you know, moving. Your joints are good, you know, your, your heart rate is good. You're able to control that. So sport is a big part of fitness. And, and I think it's a very easy entry point for a lot of people. You just want to remember that it's okay if you're bad at it. 
Yeah, and yeah. you get better if you are fit as well. You exactly. Yeah. That's the best point. Yeah. So you play it, you enjoy it, and that makes you play again. Over a period of time, you get better. And before you know it, it's just a part of your life. Right? And you're this, and you're this, you, they, they say there are people who like sport and who don't like sport. If you want to become a person who likes sport, you have to think like that person. You can't, you're not going to suddenly start liking sport from tomorrow. You're going to have to put yourself out there a little bit. So on a lighter note, um, do you watch cricket and do you have any favorite uh, player, cricketer? Definitely. I've, um, I've watched cricket all my life. Okay. In fact, there was a, when I was much younger, I don't know how I did it, um, during, I think it was 96, 97, Calypso series when India went to, you know, uh, West Indies, all the matches used to be at night, like it's morning for us. Um, it start at 9.30 and it'll go on till about 5. I would, it's a test match. I would watch the whole thing and then go to school, then come back home and watch the replay, right? So <laughs> that's how much I used to watch cricket. So yes, cricket's been a part of my life all along. And I've loved and admired so many cricketers over the ages. It's not just one person, right? I used to love uh, how Aziruddin plays, and naturally everyone likes, you know, Sachin and Kohli. Um, there's my, one of my favorites is uh, Rahul Dravid, um, the way he plays and for who he is as a person. And naturally, this is the Dhoni era, so you can't not be, you know, mesmerized by how calm he is and things like that. So, so yeah, a lot of favorites there. Nice, thanks. So what is the difference between fitness and bodybuilding? It's a very good question. Um, if I may, I'm just going to, going to drag this on a little more. Um, see, fitness initially was, was a circus act long, long ago. Most people were naturally fit because you had to do work, right? Yeah. But then there were people who were, you know, abnormally fit. And that was a circus act, you know, people who could throw, I don't know, 50 or hundreds of kilos up in the air and catch. And, that's, and people used to look at these guys like, you know, oh my God, this is amazing like a freak show. And from there, it moved on to strong men. Right? The, the, there's, even today, you can get strong men type training program. These are, these are guys who are truly strong, still not bodybuilding yet, right? But then strength, like ridiculous feats of strength. And that was interesting. From there, it moved on to bodybuilding. And even bodybuilding, only after Pumping Iron, you know, the movie with Arnold, that's when everyone knew about bodybuilding. It was a completely different sport. Right? And from bodybuilding, we moved on to what we call fitness today. Uh -huh. And you would see that from bodybuilders, after that you saw celebrities becoming you know, a little more fit. Right? Back in the day, it was just um, um, say Jackie Shroff, Sunil Chetty, just a couple of these guys who were all ripped and strong. Most people, right? it could be, a, could be a Govinda or a Vijay Kant or Rajni Kant, they were not really built. It was not a requirement. But things are changing. And even with sport, if you were talking about cricket, there was a time when you had Ranatunga, Arvind De Silva, right? I mean, Boone. This was not the age of fitness, it was about skill, right? Today, though, everyone is fit. So the difference between bodybuilding and fitness, while it is quite stark, in the sense that bodybuilding is about aesthetics, right? Is, is about how symmetrical you are, right? Like how big your muscles are. Fitness is more about functionality and performance. Right? So fitness is more applicable to someone who's, um, who's, who's, who's an actor, so to speak, right? who has to do stunts on screen, mm -hmm. right? who has to dance a certain way. You take someone like Rithik Roshan, he's extremely fit. Mm -hmm. right? you can, and when I say fit, he's clearly good looking, of course, but he's ripped, yes. But he's also mobile. He's also strong. He also can run, he can jump, he can do all these things, right? A bodybuilder may be, do, may be able to do these things, but is not required to. Right? So if you are training for bodybuilding, it's a very different skill set than you're training for performance. So if you're an athlete, if you're an actor, if you're someone who needs to move, then you want to focus more on abilities, functions, performance, and that's where fitness comes in. If you are someone who has to, who has to showcase the way you look, aesthetics, you could be a figure athlete, a bodybuilder, right? something like that, then you want to go more towards bodybuilding. One is not easier than the other, one is not better than the other, but one is different from the other. So based on what suits you and your lifestyle, you pick that. And as far as I'm concerned, fitness, if you have to define it, it is the ability to do the things that you need to do and want to do in your life. Okay, so for Roger Federer, fitness means something very different from what it means for me, and what it means for me is something very different from what it means for you. Yeah. Right, so as long as you are able to do the things in your life, mm -hmm. then you are fit. There's no reason for you to look like someone to be able to fit, be fit in your life. Yeah.
Do, would you also recommend? I know these bodybuilding. Um, you know, they take these uh, tablets, right? Uh, supplements. 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 supplements yeah. And some of them are not natural. Uh, would you recommend that? No. So, see, depends on what you're trying to do. Again, yeah. it all comes down to you know your goals. Right? If you're talking about steroids. Yeah, steroids. Right. If you're talking yeah. about steroids, um, I would definitely not recommend it. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't think there is a need for anyone to take steroids, mm -hmm. but there are people who do for their own reasons. If you are someone who is trying to get fit so you can be healthy for longer, if you're trying to increase your lifespan and your health span, then you want to focus on movement, nutrition, sleep, and stress. Right. Mm -hmm. Supplements are okay because supplements are essentially that. You're supplementing, you know, your body or your yeah. diet with whatever it is that you're that, that is missing yeah. that you don't get from natural sources yeah. now let's say you're you're a vegetarian you don't get too much protein how are you going to get your protein you still need it so a protein supplement is absolutely fine right so but that that doesn't mean that say you can have a fiber supplement and not have any vegetables right so you use it you use it well you don't abuse it on the steroid side of things that is a um, uh, it, it's confusing because the point of steroids is to improve performance Right? And they're called PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. Right? So if you're a bodybuilder and you want to look a certain way, or if you're a or if you're professional athletes, you want to perform a certain way, and you're taking these PEDs, you're going to be banned from the sport. Oh. It's not even legal to do those things. But if you're a recreational athlete, no one's stopping you from doing it. But my personal opinion is why would you do it? Mm -hmm. If there are risks. Mm -hmm. Right? This this is like when people take steroids, and when I take steroids, when I say take steroids, they, they just you know inject themselves with steroids, and it happens commonly. Almost all of them would say, "I'm not addicted to this. I can stop this anytime." Yeah. Okay? This is exactly what every cocaine addict said before they became an addict, right? Because we don't know that we're going to get addicted to it. Yeah. We believe that somehow I am protected from this addiction. I know my limits. I can stop whenever. But you don't realize when it becomes when it takes over. Right? So there is a big difference between use and abuse. As far as supplements, use, don't abuse. As far as steroids, well, don't even use. That's the only way to not abuse it. Any supplements you would recommend? Yeah, some supplements, definitely. See, uh, the thing is, even if your nutrition is 100% today, mm -hmm. given the kind of food that we get and the quality of food that we get, we will still be missing certain things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to get specific, you can do a, a food allergy test. You can do a, you know, basically a, a blood test also to understand what deficiencies you have, and you can have supplements. But for the for the general population, most of us are lacking protein. Okay, so some form of protein supplementation is good. This can be whey protein, can be plant-based protein. As long as it's a good brand, you know, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would recommend is uh, magnesium, which mm -hmm. would help most people. Right? See, magnesium is something that we used to get a lot from natural sources before. You still can, but it's just not happening. Mm. So it is simple enough to take magnesium. It's not a dangerous supplement. It's a simple supplement. It calms you down. Right? It helps with digestion, helps with sleep, and you can get these easily. The other thing that you can look into is vitamin D. You get vitamin D from the sun, but how many of us get sun? We don't really get sunlight. Right? In fact, if you just close your eyes and randomly pick two people, they're probably going to be deficient in vitamin D. That's mm -hmm. the state of things. Right? So either get your levels checked and get enough sunlight or get your levels checked and supplement. Right? These are three safe supplements that yeah. you can take. Um, a multivitamin pill, to be very honest, research is very indecisive. There is no research that says it's amazing for you and there is no research that says it's dangerous. Right? So it's, it's kind of like a cheap insurance. You have a pill a day, it fills in a few gaps here and there, so you can do that if you want to. Right? But as long as your nutrition is on point, this is pretty much all you need. You don't have to kind of get into this whole you know, supplement war kind of thing. Like There are people who have 20, 30, 40 supplements a day. You don't need to go there as long as you're eating well. Why do you not... Uh, call yourself fitness influencer is it because you feel it's a responsibility no not at all not at all so see um, see I've been writing content um, writing about fitness talking about fitness for years okay um, I guess you be, I, I guess you get called influencer when you have a certain number of followers I don't know what the uh, what the requirements the are. are yeah <laughs> what the metrics are because as far as I'm concerned it's very simple 
I am trying to be useful, right? As simple as that. And this is something that I've said before also is that um, we run, you know, the quad and the quad is a great place to train. I, I wish I had something like the quad when I started fitness, right? Because at the quad, we specialize in getting beginners, right? Rank beginners. And in a few months, you, you, would, you would swear that they're not beginners, right? So we're, we're really good at doing that. And, and, and that's the goal, to obviously help people and have a very deep impact in people's lives. And we do that with the quad. The sense that we have people who work with us for eight years, nine years, 10 years, right? For consistently for years, and you're literally changing lives. And that's wonderful. But the one thing that's a problem is, doesn't matter how much knowledge I have, doesn't matter how much experience I have, if you have to work with me, the only way you can work with me is if you can register at the quad in the center that I am coaching, right? Which is in a, in a way limiting. Right. Again, not from a brand perspective, very personally speaking. So my goal has always been to reach as many people as possible and help them kind of, you know, guide themselves in the right direction. So how can I do that? And that is why, you know, that, that's why I write, that's why I do social media, all that. And I've been doing this for a long time. Lately, because of these whole, you know, reels and stuff like that, the numbers have gone up more. And so suddenly you become an influencer, right? So as far as I'm concerned, there's, there's no difference between then and now. And the reason I also don't like calling myself an influencer is that, see, the, 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 I guess the word influencer means that you are influencing, you know, how people think and what they buy and what they consume, right? I'm not here to do that. I am just here to share knowledge, right? I'm just here to share experiences and knowledge. I'm trying to be useful to you in your journey when it's necessary, that's it. I do no promotions, I don't sell products, and I think that, that, is, that is a little confusing for me, right? Because think about it, if, if an influencer is uh, promoting a particular product, how does it work and how is it true? Now, let's say I have the product and you're the influencer. I reach you, I reach out to you and I say, can you please talk about this product? I will pay you X, Y, Z, you know, whatever money. So already I'm paying you money to talk about my product. Yeah. Right? So firstly, the interest comes from me and then the money goes to you. Now, there is very, very, very low chances that you would give me a true you know, review because you're getting paid for it. Well said. Right? Yeah. So right there, it breaks down. And even beyond that, if you're sharing a review, even if it's a bad review, you're going to tone it down a lot simply because, well, you want other brands to work with you. Yeah. Right? And as an influencer, if this is your way of making money, then you are going to look out for yourself first up. So anything that you're putting out there is not raw, is not real. Mm -hmm. And if you are being raw, then brands won't want to work with you. Right? right? And this is, uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not new. See, even with, um, even with scientific studies, if you think about scientific studies, which, which we all go by, these scientific studies are expensive. They cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a study. Especially if it involves a thousand people over six months or whatever. So why would anyone do a study? There's no reason. I can't say, oh, you know what? I just want to find out the answer. So I'm going to give hundred thousand dollars. It's not going to happen. So if I'm a company and I want my product to look good, I will sponsor that study. Now, if I sponsor that study, there is already a bias in that study. Right. Right. And that's why anytime you see a study out there, you're going to have to see who sponsored it. Who are the people who did the study? How are they affiliated with the sponsors? All these things matter. The same concept applies to influencers also. If an influencer is recommending a product, why is she or he doing that? That's a question that you need to ask. Right? So if a brand approaches me and brand is, brands, approach, brands approach me every day, can you talk about this? And I tell them the same thing. I will not take any money from this. In fact, I don't take any money from social media. I do uh, workshops and sessions and stuff like that. All the money that comes in through social media goes to charitable causes. It's very simple. Okay. Right? Because like I said, the quad is where you know, we run business. That is where we are creating deep impact. And that is what we want to grow. And from our perspective, the quad is something, and this is, this is not our words, but all our students and our clients tell us that it's making such a big difference in their lives. So as founders, we believe that, is it, that it is irresponsible of us to not grow the brand because it is a net net positive in the society. And that's where I want to be focusing on. Social media is about sharing knowledge, yeah. right? If someone listens to it and they're like, that makes sense. I'm going to try and implement this. Great. I've done my job. And I write, post, talk, whatever for an audience of one. What I mean by that is if one person benefits from the post, I'm good. I'm not looking for anything from it. I'm not looking to make money out of it, right? And that's why the whole influencer term doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, there's anything wrong with it.
I mean, there, 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 are, there are people who do it really well. And there are people who make a living out of it. And it's amazing that social media has provided an opportunity for people to do that. Like restaurants, for instance, thrive on influencers. Mm -hmm. right? Like if I have a restaurant, how am I going to get the word out there? I call an influencer, they come and talk about it, and that's great. But on the fitness side of things, where you, can, where you have the power to actually affect a person's health, I think it's a big responsibility, and it should not be taken lightly. And I don't know who I'm talking to, right? How can I recommend something, or how can I give you specific um, guidelines or advice if I don't know who I'm talking to? Now, if I said running 10 kilometers in an hour is great, and now this person who has a heart issue goes and runs 10 kilometers an hour, is that safe? No. no. So you need to be very careful about it, yeah. right? And the moment money is involved, bias comes in. And that's what doesn't sit well with me. Wonderful. Yeah. What about online classes uh, yeah. that you've spoken about, uh, yeah. the online medium, mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking about influencers, I mean, how do online classes work for you? I mean, are they effective? Are they, do you recommend them? Um, yes. In fact, um, I'm glad you asked me that question, right? Because pre-pandemic yeah. didn't exist, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I mean, Zoom existed even then, yeah. but except no one tried it, no one wanted to do it. And fitness was always something that, you know, you go to a gym and you do it. Yeah. Now, here's something that's interesting. Um, when the pandemic struck, uh, both Arvind and I, we, again, thanks to all the research that we've done, we knew that this is not going to be a three-week thing or a three-month thing. It's going to be a couple of years. We know that. You look at any pandemic, you know, in the past, you'll know that. So we realized that this is not going to be something that just goes away. So we need to pivot. We need to do something different. So what we did is we basically we shut all our classes well before, you know, the government shut things. In fact, the, the government shut, the, the first day of full lockdown was March 22nd. I remember that because it was my birthday and it was amazing. Okay? <laughs> just being alone. Uh, but we shut classes a week before that. Right, on the 15th of March, and we said no more classes. And we started thinking about how we can work with students because we have students and they need to get their fitness fix one way or the other. So we were thinking about various options and we stumbled upon Zoom and we said, let's figure this out. Let's see how we can do this. So what we did is we have a lot of kettlebells. Okay, we have, we had, we have five, six, five centers in the city, so we have hundreds of kettlebells. So what we did is we reached out to all our students and we said, what is the kettlebell that you want? We will send it to your house. So we arranged for Dunzo. We had like 150 of these Dunzo you know, um, uh, representatives staying there. They all picked up these bells and went and dropped it in people's houses. And then we started running classes virtually okay, through Zoom. Initially, it was a little you know, here and there because it's hard to coach. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't see people from different angles. Um, the camera is a little off here and there. But with every class, we tried to figure it out. We started working. And over a couple of months, we were able to coach everything virtually. Well, okay, and that was a great solution to the pandemic problem because people couldn't leave the house, but everyone was training. Our classes were full, right? In fact, during that one year of the pandemic, we doubled in size as far as you know, clients and students really? are concerned. Yeah, it was phenomenal because it was something different. Most importantly, right? I mean, given how the how, how the mood, how the vibe was at that point of time. This was something refreshing for people. You had a reason to wake up, right? Yeah. And you were able to do this. And so many people got into fitness at that point. But here's the even more interesting bit. After the pandemic, in-person classes were open and everything. While this solved the pandemic problem, our virtual classes, until today, are solving so many other problems. And you know what I'm talking about here? I'm talking about women and fitness, right? Usually in a gym, it's about 80% men, 20% women. Okay? Women are usually in the whole treadmill section doing cardio. Men are all in the you know, weight section you know, with, with this toxic masculinity in the air, right? you know, pumping iron. That's usually how it is. And that's something we never liked. And at the quad, as far as we are concerned, we're like, it has to be gender neutral. It has to be inclusive. Everyone is the same, and we have to work with everyone. And that's how the quad was. And our focus always was to get more women into strength training. Because women, after a certain age, have a bunch of issues with respect to bones. Yeah. Right? Bone density you know, keeps getting lower and lower. So strength training is a necessity, not a choice. But how do we get women in? When we looked into it, we realized that women don't go to the gym for many reasons. A few of those are, one, even though we're in 2024, it is still women who do most of the chores at home. 
they take care of kids, morning chores, all that, number one. Number two, the number of women who drive when compared to the number of men who drive is much lesser. So especially if you want to go to the gym in the morning, you're dependent on someone. Yeah. And there's a risk of going out in the dark. And third, very sad to say this, but it's true, women don't feel comfortable in gyms because people are ogling. People look at them through the mirrors. It is, it is nasty, right? So why would women want to go and take care of themselves when they have to jump through so many hoops? Virtual solves all of this. And it's amazing because you can log in at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. We have classes through the day. Okay, we have classes at 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And so we have people from all over the world working, right? And it is so accessible because all you need is just a phone, right? And we have figured out how to coach you well. So basically our classes will have four to five coaches and there will be small groups and someone's watching at all points of time. If you need to learn something, they'll move you into a breakout room. Right? Oh. Coach you there, then you come to the main class. Newbies are, uh, new students are worked with separately. People are injured are worked with separately. Mm. Right? Different people with different goals are worked with separately. So all that is solved. So there's literally no difference between training in person and virtually. And when I say no difference, I'm talking about attendance. I'm talking about injuries. I'm talking about progress. Results all mm. are the same. Mm. Right? So it's great because now, like I said, women can do this. And so many women, again, because they have to take care of kids, are still able to train when their kids are awake. They're, they're just right there while women are doing this. And if classes are ending at seven o'clock by seven or two, they can get back to doing whatever. And guess what? Our split in our virtual sessions, male, female split. I said in a gym, it's 80, 20, 80 men, 20 women. In our virtual classes today, it is 78% women, 22% men. I mean, how amazing is that? Yeah. Right? So I think this whole virtual life coaching is awesome especially considering how over the next 10 to 20 years, so many more people are going to get into fitness, yeah. right? And right now, what are we telling all these people? We're saying gyms are there, stadiums are there, get used to that. But for most people, gyms are intimidating. It is scary, right? Yeah. When they go to like a turf or when they go to a gym, they're like, this is not where I belong. But if you can train at home, if all you need is a little kettlebell or not even that, Right, just body weight work, anyone can start. And zero to one is the hardest part, right? So, Starting, yeah. So how do you check the body posture? Because in a kettlebell, you're, you're supposed to be very careful with your postures, you're supposed to be very careful about your back, all right? And how, how do you manage um, that? So, avoid injuries. Yeah, see, the, the, the only way you can actually understand it is by being a part of class, okay? So I'd love to have the two of you try out a class, right? Just so you understand <laughs> this. Uh, but to put it very simplistically, we have figured out the right angles okay. and the right instructions. Right? See, at, at the end of the day, it, it is about how you're coaching. Coaching is not just uh, making people tired. Yeah. And there's a difference between uh, exercising, working out, training, coaching, all these things, right? So when you're coaching, when you're coming there, you're coming there to learn, mm. right? We are a company which, which focuses on coaching. So we are constantly improving our coaching methods. Right, so how you do this, so every move is broken down into multiple little moves, mm -hmm. into many, many drills. So, so it's not like day one you come in there and we're like, okay, here's a workout, do it. Now, the first three weeks is foundations. Mm -hmm. You're just learning how to move. We teach you how to squat, we teach you how to plank, right? And we know what cues to give and what to watch yeah. and how to give those cues to you so you're able to do it well. Right, so it's hard to explain exactly how, yeah. but if you have to specify, it is attention to detail. Mm -hmm. right? Making sure someone's constantly watching you. Kindness, empathy, and positivity. I know this sounds like fluff when it comes to fitness, <laughs> but I kid you not, we are not talking about athletes who have to be, you know, just hit hard and pushed and, you know, humiliated. And that's how, for whatever reason, coaching happens, mm. right? Like, I mean, kids are treated that way. That's not how we like to do this. We are talking about people, right? People do better when you're nice to them, simple. Yeah. Right. So if you are kind enough to understand that a person is going through whatever it is they're going through mm -hmm. and that they've never moved in their life, accept, meet them where they are in their journey, as opposed to forcing them to meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. right? They're not going to understand if you give them complicated words. If you tell them 10 things to do at once, it's not going to happen. Right? Yeah. When you teach a kid how to swim or to ride a bicycle, they're not going to do it without making mistakes. So expect them to make mistakes, right? So be empathetic. Yeah. Understand that the very fact that they made it to class is a big deal, yeah. right? And that's what's necessary. And be positive. Like, I mean, don't keep finding fault, 
right? Appreciate them for every small win. Because the more positive you are, the more often they'll show up. The more often they show up, the faster they learn. Yeah, encouraging, right? yeah. Exactly, right? So so it, it's about the whole vibe. Mm -hmm. And this is not this is not just me. This is the entire organization. This is every single coach. And our core values call for this. Right? So we break it down into many little parts. Uh, we also have a very detailed program. So our programming has been planned for the entire year. So it's called periodization. Mm -hmm. So basically for the whole year. If you ask me today, what are you going to be doing in February of 2025? I have an answer. Well, okay. right? So we've planned that out. So the year is broken now, is, is a macro cycle. The year is broken down into four meso cycles every quarter. Mm -hmm. And every quarter is broken down into 11 to 12 micro cycles, which is a week. Mm -hmm. right? And inside each of this, you will learn a certain skill, you will train that certain skill and in every quarter, every meso cycle, there's a certain goal. So mm -hmm. basically, first quarter, you're focusing on strength and say weight loss. Next quarter, you're working on anaerobic endurance. Next quarter, you're working on mobility. So basically, you're layering things, right? Okay. So the goal is for a student, virtual or in person, over the course of a year, you get stronger, you get leaner, you get faster and you learn skills. Excellent. So if you can layer it that way, think about what you can achieve in you know, five years. Yeah. Right, like they say, we overestimate what we can do in two days, we underestimate what we can do in two years, right? Yeah. So we are big proponents of compounding, learning skills and getting there. So virtual is filled with, you know, skill coaching, learning, practice, positivity, kindness. So it's, it's one big package. And organization also. I mean, I think you're so organized. Where did you get that from? Um, we, we, we are uh, fairly well organized. I think there's, there's a, we can be a lot more organized. Um, see, overall, like I said, we are trained engineers, right, both of us. So I guess as a part of yeah. school and college and, you know, the work that you do, a certain amount of organizational skills are already there, yeah. right? So what we, to be very, very completely honest with you, our goal with fitness would, was not just with respect to clients, okay? We wanted to change the industry. Mm -hmm. See, up until then, fitness, gyms, coaching was kind of like a blue-collar job. I mean, people are not really respected for, for doing that as a profession. You know, it's like, this was a time when, you know, you'd have a trainer come home and he'd be like, just wait for a few minutes. I'm having my coffee. I'm going to have a shower and come, you know, whatever, right? So there was no mutual respect. So our goal here was to really change the way fitness was perceived inside and out. Right? So we wanted to make fitness a proper career for people. Right? So you cannot create careers if you're not organized. So right now, the quad is not a gym. It's an organization. And what I mean by that is um, we have various teams. We have coaching teams, we have business teams, we have operations teams, you know, sales teams, accounting teams, all these things. But not just that. We have our quarterly reviews. We have half yearly reviews. You have manager reviews. You have annual reviews, right? So you have a mentor for every single person in the oh, organization. Work, huh? Yeah, so organization building is something that we are very focused on. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the pandemic uh, uh, stressed on the importance of these things, right? Both on the financial and on the human resources side. So our goal is to create an organization where someone is able to consistently grow. Not just like, so it's not just one path. You don't just start off as a trainer and you're like, you just keep training forever, right? So in fact, you start off as a trainer one, you become a trainer two, then there's senior trainer one, senior trainer two, assistant coach one, assistant coach two, and then you become a coach, then there is a head coach. And after that, you either become a department head, right? You become a project manager, right? You become a leader in the organization. So the goal here is to create an organization that is nothing short of, say, world-class as far as any industry is concerned. Because fitness industry is, as important as any other industry. And we need to provide an opportunity and a channel for people to grow. And for that, organization, you know, organizational skills are important. Absolutely. So we're constantly trying to improve that. Uh, but as far as the service is concerned, we like to be organized because one thing that we said right from the start is the time part of it. No one's on time anywhere, right? So in fact, at the Quad, it's a very different world, okay? It's a world where you know, things are inclusive, things are kind, but things are also happen punctually, and right? you need to be there on time. So we tried to stress this and bring this in right from the get-go. Both Arvind and I were very, um, very focused on getting this done. Now we are making sure that whoever it is, is running the centers and stuff are also able to do that. So how do you keep yourself updated with the latest uh, health and uh, fitness trend and 
what is the latest uh, now? Um, the second question, I can't answer it because by the time I'm done answering it, something new will come <laughs> up, right? <laughs> so, see, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say trends and also we're, we're in this whole fast fashion age, yeah. right? Where something new has to keep dropping yeah. at all points of time. And we spoke about influencers and this is a big stressor for influencers also because they have to keep up with the trends, right? It could be the way they make their videos or what they're talking about. And this is why you have a lot of the scaremongering videos also because you're trying to get eyeballs on you. Right? And, you, and literally our attention spans have become so short. Right? If you don't get someone's attention uh, on Instagram, for example, within the first three seconds, mm. they're, just, they're just going off. So if I have to get your attention in the first three seconds, I have to say something ridiculous. Only then you're going to stick around for the next 10 seconds. Yeah. And then I have to say something deep and you know, so on and so forth. Right? So, so trends are a very tricky thing. Right? So something that we believe in is we don't believe in focusing on the next big thing. Because if your focus is the next big thing, you will only always keep working on the next big thing. Right? There are certain things which are the foundation of fitness. That's what we focus on. Okay? And as far as lifestyle and fitness is concerned, that is movement, nutrition, sleep, and stress. Okay? And breath work, all that falls within the whole stress angle. So these are what we you know, tackle. How do we, keep, um, you know, how do we keep up with the trends? To be very honest, two answers. One is, firstly, how do we come, how do we get to know about these trends? Well, you don't have to try anymore. They just reach you now, right? With, you're, you're always connected, so you, so, you know, so you hear about those things. But the best way to keep up with trends is to ignore most of them, <laughs> right? Because these trends are, that's what they are. They come and they go, right? And students, clients, people are going to keep asking you about this. And I mean, you remember keto. Yeah. No one's talking about it now, why? Right, there was a time when people couldn't shut up about it, right? Shouldn't, should, couldn't get enough of it. Bullet, uh, what was that? Bullet coffee, um, you know, the, the, the keto, paleo, right? All that. And then there was intermittent fasting and there is always something or the other you know, coming up. What you want to remember though is that, see, all these are tools. You need to be able to use these tools to build, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to build. But if you get lost in a, in a trend or if you get too hooked, then that's it. We are only going to last for those two weeks. And then the next trend comes and you're no one, right? So it's important to actually understand the essence of what you're doing and not get lost in the specifics. So we don't try to keep up with trends in the sense that our programming, like I said, is, is, is very um, scientific in nature. The sense that there is a reason for why we do what we do. Why do you do this movement? Why do you do so many reps? Why do you do it at this weight? All that is scientifically planned, right? So when, when you are taking that route, then the trends don't matter. At the end of the day, strength training is important, endurance is important, flexibility is important, mobility is important, you know that. Right? Now, if someone's going to come and tell me, oh, strength training doesn't matter anymore, well, that doesn't make sense. Right? So when in doubt, trust science. Would you yourself follow a keto diet or intermittent fasting, or would you recommend? Do you do that? Have you ever tried? Uh, I've tried everything. Okay, so uh, in fact, as a part of the first two years when we got all these certifications, the other thing we did, both me and you know, my co-founder Arvin, were we tried out all these diets and programs, mm -hmm. right? Paleo, keto, low fat, low carb, and we were basically trying out N equal to one, N equal to two, mm -hmm. right? Am I losing more weight with low fat or with low carb, right? Because you're still, see, for, for most people who don't understand um, the, the, the basics of nutrition or of a calorie deficit of how weight loss works, Every diet is different. Mm -hmm. It suddenly feels like, oh, this diet could be magic. Mm -hmm. I heard that this person lost so much weight in that diet. I should be doing that right now, right? Because you don't really understand it. But here's the key. Every diet is actually the same thing, okay? If you think about it, every diet is simply a set of restrictions. Set of restrictions that are meant to reduce the amount of calories that you are consuming. Okay, take low fat. What does low fat diet do? It doesn't let you eat too much fat. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it reduces the amount of calories you consume, so you lose weight. What does a low carb diet do? It does the same thing by restricting carbohydrates. Right? What does say paleo diet do? It does the same thing by restricting all grains mm -hmm. and vegetable oils and all that. What does a plant-based diet do? Restricting the amount of you know, energy you're consuming by not letting you have any animal products, right? Obviously, I'm talking about diets for weight loss here. What does intermittent fasting do? It does the same thing by restricting your eating window. That's all. 
There's no magic to any of these diets, right? So there's nothing wrong with following any of these diets. But the moment it becomes a ism, veganism, this ism, that ism, right? Then it's a problem. Because then you subscribe to something that is in a way larger than you. Then you start defending it irrespective of its merits or demerits. Right? So if you can understand that this is what it's meant to do, then you use it. Like me personally, uh, like I said, I've tried all of it, but how do I eat on a daily basis? Um, I follow certain simple rules, right? I am more of a principle, strategy kind of, kind of guy as opposed to a rules kind of guy. The problem with rules is you follow rules when you don't understand things, right? To give you a simple example, take traffic rules. There's red, there's orange, and there's green. Right? It's a rule. If there's red, you stop. If there's green, you go. Right? But technically speaking, if it's red and there's no one else on the road, I should be able to go. But what does the government say? I can't trust everyone to make their best judgment. So it's simpler if you go with the rule. So everyone stops when it's red, then there's no risk of someone getting hurt. Right? So similarly with nutrition, diets are basically rules. For someone who doesn't understand it, it is simpler to follow a rule. Right? Low fat, eat no fat. It's a simple enough rule. Right? Intermittent fasting, don't eat at this time. Simple enough rule, you don't have to think about it. Right? But what I like to do is I like to teach my students or my clients the principles behind this. Once you understand it, and I strongly believe that something like nutrition, which is something you're going to uh, deal with for the rest of your life, you should be able to strategize. Right? Because the way you eat and the way I eat are different. Right? Like you might like different foods, I might like different foods, different cultures, different cuisines. Right? So one rule book is not going to help. But instantly, if you can understand strategies, for instance, every meal should contain protein, vegetables, and starch. Simple enough. Doesn't matter which cuisine, doesn't matter who you are, what kind of protein. But some protein, some vegetables, some starch. That will make sure that you're getting what you need to do. Right? So rules like this will, I mean, sorry, uh, strategies like this will help you navigate right, through this complex world of you know, nutrition than to follow rules where you feel restricted. Yeah. Right? So personally, I like intermittent fasting right? for two reasons. One is obviously the health benefits of fasting. Right? And, and there is a reason why fasting is a part of every culture, every religion in the world. Right? There are health benefits for it. That's one. The other part is the convenience of it. I don't have to think about food in the morning. Right? I love to eat. My day revolves around food, don't get me wrong. That is, uh, the first thing I think about when I wake up is what am I going to have for lunch? And right? when I'm eating lunch, I'm thinking about dinner. And my lunch is a good 45 minutes and dinner is a good 45 minutes. Right? Now, obviously, I can't, I can't be reckless and mindless in the way I'm eating. Right? So I, I need to have certain restrictions. So intermittent fasting is great because mornings for me in general are very active and very busy. From 5 a.m. till about 1 p.m., I'm slammed. Right? I'm, I'm training, I'm coaching, I'm working, I'm doing one of these things. And at this point of time, I like to be alert. When you're slightly hungry, you know, you are alert. Very, you know, evolutionally yeah. speaking, when you're slightly hungry, you are alert looking for things, yeah. right? And you're not sluggish, right? Also, I don't have the 30, 40 minutes to cook and eat breakfast. And I also don't want to just, you know, grab something by the mouthful and eat. So I would rather not eat in the morning. It works for me. But my lunch is a good 40, 45 minutes, like I said. I'll have protein, vegetables, and starch, something to drink. I like to eat slowly, because when you eat slowly, you're more mindful, you're more in control, right? So for that reason, I use intermittent fasting, not because it's gonna magically help me lose more weight or get me ripped, right? So just like a, a hammer, a spanner, you know, a screwdriver, these are all tools. We need to learn to use these tools well, and that's why you work with a coach. A good coach is someone who has a lot of these tools, who uses the right tools with the right person for the right job. If I only have one tool, and if I say everyone who works with me should do intermittent fasting, that makes no sense. Right? That's just saying it's working for me, so it has to work for you, but it doesn't work that way at all. What about breathing, uh, Raj? Can you throw some light on you know, breathing, the importance of breathing properly yeah. and breathing correctly? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I said the four things, right? I mean, exercise, nutrition, you know, sleep and stress. Stress is one big part of our lives. And it's not that we've not been stressed before. Stress has always been a part of our lives and our body is meant to deal with stress. Right? And it's, it's not that uh, stress is bad. Stress is important. Right? Without stress, we wouldn't be alive. But you need to be able to optimize your stress. You have to manage your stress. Right? Stress management is what most people struggle with today. 
And with stress, there are two types of stress. There are, there's acute stress and there's chronic stress. Acute stress is stress that happens you know, quickly and at a very high level, and then it goes away. Our bodies are used, or designed rather, to handle acute stress. Exercise is acute stress. Like when, when, when you're lifting a weight, you're stressing your body, but your body understands that, okay, next time this happens, I have to be ready. So it adapts to that acute stress by getting stronger. Chronic stress, though, is basically low-level stress that just is there always. For instance, let's say you don't like your job, you have a bad manager, or you're in an unhappy marriage, or someone is unwell at home. Right? All these things are chronic stressors, where you're constantly worried about something. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's like a 3 or a 4, but it's always there. Right? And if you think about today's life, we have a lot of chronic stress. When you wake up in the morning, you see something on social media, right? or someone said something about you, and you have that stress a little bit. You have a little anxiety around it. Right? Then you have to get ready for work, you have a project meeting coming up, you're driving on the road, there's traffic there, you go into work, someone didn't finish something. So we are filled with this chronic stress through the day. And that is something that we need to learn to manage. And breathing is a great tool for stress management. Wow. Right? So most of us, we end up shallow breathing throughout the day. Yeah. Right? Unfortunately, none of us really do the belly breathing that we're talking about, diaphragmatic breathing. It's sad to say, but we don't have time to breathe. That's literally how it is today. Right? In reality, if you can take a few minutes every day to just focus on your breathing, that will have a profound effect on your mental and physical wellness. But do you stress on breathing at the quad? as well when you're doing your exercises too. Yes, so we, we, we focus on breathing, um, not necessarily, uh, during classes, as in when you're training, okay. after class, when you're stretching, obviously you breathe. Yeah. There are different types of breathing also. When you're, when you're exerting yourself, you breathe differently. But the kind of breath work I'm talking about here is something everyone should be doing. Yeah. Right now, there, there is a certain type of breathing you can do in the morning, which will basically you know, get you alert, which will wake you up. Mm -hmm. And then there's a type of breathing you do at night, which will calm you down, mm -hmm. slow you down, help you sleep. And then there's also different types of breathing which can help you deal with overwhelming, um, anxiety-inducing situations. Right? These there are all little things that we can do and there are so many apps available also right now. Uh -huh. It's just that we're not taking the time to do it. But rest assured that if you can include breathing as a part of your life, it will have such a positive effect on your overall health. Yeah. Right? In fact, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard, today, aging has been deemed a disease, which is phenomenal <laughs> because if it's a disease, then it can be cured. Yeah. Right? Oh. <laughs> so that's the idea. So the, the idea here is that lifespan keeps increasing thanks to healthcare. So up until right now, our lifespan increased. We went from 65 to 80, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Not because we've gotten healthier, because healthcare has improved. Mm -hmm. right? You have implants, you have medicines, you have all these things that help you live mm -hmm. longer. But while lifespan has increased, health span has not. Quality of life is still going down. And a big reason for that is lack of sleep and stress. And they're all connected, if you know what I mean, right? Naturally, and exercise and nutrition is there, but I'm just not mentioning it, right? So when you think about it that way, you want to improve not just how long you're living, but how well you feel during those years, yeah. right? And these are little things, breath work and you know, sleep and things like that, little things that you can do that compound over a period of time. Absolutely. If you can take 20 minutes a day, morning, evening, everything put together to breathe, amazing. Right. I'm not someone, uh, I mean, meditation is great, yeah. but when you think about meditation, you're always thinking about someone in this very yeah. zen pose with this, you know, halo around their head. And so it's, it's, got, this, it's got this vibe around it, right? And it's intimidating for a lot of people. You don't even have to think about it that way. Just sit down, close your eyes and breathe. Right? Especially today where you're b bombarded with, you know, information and stimuli, mm -hmm. you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. It helps you really take some time off and breathe. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long would you recommend? So, um, the, the, see, at the, if you can do... If you can do five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the evening, that's mm. great. Oh, wow. right? And I kid you not, you will feel so much better. If you're someone who wears a smartwatch, you can see your heart rate just fall. Wow. Right? Like for me, if, if I, I, and I like to, I, I'm not picky when it comes to any of this. I will do these things anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I like to do my meditation and stuff or breathing for like 15, 20 minutes at night when my son is eating. I will sit in the living room and I'll do it. Right? Sometimes my wife's going to be like, you have to do it right here. Like, you know. But it's the same thing with running. I will just put my shoes on and get out there and run. Right? So if you're going to wait for the perfect situation and time to do it, it's not going to happen. 
right? I, I'll probably do a bunch of breathing on my way back on the drive right now. Mm. When you're on the plane, you can do it, right? Mm. So two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, they, all these things add up. They all compound over a period of time. Mm. But the important thing is, are you mindful? Right? Are you trying to do these things whenever possible? Instead of saying, I need one hour a day to meditate, one hour a day to exercise, I need this particular diet to eat, it's never going to work that way. You have to make it a part of your life. Right? As in, we have to learn to live in this world as opposed to saying, I'm going to go 50 years back and I'm going to live like right. that. Right? Yeah. So you're a dad, okay? And how is parenting? How do you spend your time with your son? And have you introduced fitness to him? Uh, good question. Um, How I'll, old is he? he? He's six. He's okay. six. Um, I love being a dad. Um, he was born in 2018. So he spent a good chunk of his childhood, you know, say during the pandemic, right? 2020, he was around one and a half, two years old when that happened, uh, which is great because I got to spend a lot of time with him. Yeah. And so um, as a dad, uh, life has really changed because your priorities change. Uh, everything that you thought was important before is not anymore, right? And um, it felt like you were busy before, and now you realize, what was I doing with all my time back then, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging because, you know, you have to kind of always be on the move, but it is incredibly rewarding to be an involved parent, right? I'm not sure how many people uh, resonate with that, but I, but I do feel that the, the, the more, at the end of the day, it's about being there. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's about being there. Right? I mean, there's, there's nothing amazing to do there. But as long as you're there, yeah. you're going to see these things happen. Mm -hmm. As far as, say, uh, fitness is concerned, that's, that's something I'm, I'm very careful about. Um, just like you asked me this question. Most people feel that, oh, okay, your son, he should be into fitness by now already. Right? Like, I didn't do anything with respect to fitness until I was 26 or 27. So it's not like I'm some... I don't know, it's like Olympic athlete who's always been training like 15 hours a day, none of that. So I'm very careful with that in the sense that he has to be interested in it. I will stress on the importance of movement. I mean, he's a very active child, like a little too active, you know what I mean? So the activity part is not a problem. But on the nutrition side, it is so easy for kids to, you know, start eating junk food. It's so easy. I mean, apple versus say an Oreo cookie and an Oreo will win any day, right? Any day. And in so many ways. So it's important for us to teach them that. So what I try to do is to basically try and teach them the same principles that I follow. Every meal you eat, there has to be some protein, some vegetable, some starch. Mm -hmm. So if I ask him what is the protein in this, what is the vegetable in this, he should be able to say. right? And it's not like it's an easy journey. You're constantly working on it. But with respect to exercise and stuff, I don't want him to ever feel like I have to do this mm -hmm. because my dad is doing that. right? But he has to do it for his health. Yeah. Right? And I would love for him to start, you know, pick up on a sport or do something of that sort. But it's not something that I would be like, you have to do it, right? Or I'm not going to be the person who's going to be body shaming someone, right? Again, positivity, kindness, empathy is the overall message with fitness. And that applies whether it's family mm. or not. Yeah. As far as time is concerned, um, see, previously I used to coach um, every day. Right? So my days were very different. I'd wake up at 3.30 in the morning. Our classes uh, start at 5. Wake up at 3.30, go, go in by 4.30, set things up. Classes start at 5, go on till about 8. We'll have a debrief meeting till 8.30. I'll train after that. So about 9.30, I'll come home, have a quick shower and drive to the office. And in the office from 10 to say 1.30, meetings, meetings, meetings. You come home and you have the first meal of the day at 2 o'clock. And then I nap because uh, I get up very early in the morning. So I'll nap in the afternoon wake up in the evening, do more work, client base, I mean, uh, 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 emails, phone calls, class plan for the next day. By 7, 7.30, you're spending time, you know, with family. That's how life used to be. But that cannot be life when you have a kid also, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So I was, I was conscious of that and I did want to make a change. And I was thinking, you know what, I want to take a couple of quarters off so I can, you know, spend time with him when he's kind of getting to kindergarten. And I was like, I should be able to go and drop him in school, pick him up from school. And especially, you see, when you're in the fitness field as a coach, you're working mostly before people start work mm -hmm. and after people finish work. Yeah. So that's just you know, a requirement for the job. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can go to bed at 8 o'clock. Then when are you going to spend time with your family? So luckily, the pandemic was at that point. Yeah. So everything was happening at home. So I got to spend a lot of time. Now, um, I don't coach every day. Mm. It's, it's different. And I'm, I'm very particular about being there to get him ready in the morning. Between me and my wife, we have our days, you know, like mm. she'll do half the days, I'll do half the days. So we go drop him in school, pick him up from school. So I try and spend as much time as possible with him. Even when he's playing with his friends, I'm around. 
because I know very soon he won't want me around, <laughs> yeah. right? So, like they say, uh, all these things with kids, there is going to be a last time and you'll never know where it is the last time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so try to soak it in as much as possible. Wonderful. What is the right age to join fitness? Um, and do you, would you say that like a 13, 14, 15 year old should do weight training? What are your thoughts on okay. that? Okay, so um, I have a slightly different stance on this. I, I don't think there is an age to get started with fitness, right? Because again, as far as um, fitness is concerned, fitness is movement. Yeah. It's just structured movement, that's it, right? Like you're walking, you don't say anything about that, but if someone's running, you're saying you're exercising. But running is basically another way of walking, right? Just doing it a little faster. You sit on a couch and get back up, that is just sitting and standing, but you squat, now that becomes exercise, right? But in reality, these are all just functional everyday movements. So you can start training, you know, for fitness at any point of time. In fact, you know, in, in, in China, say uh, uh, the kids who go to Olympics, they start training when they're three years old. Okay? That is intense training. Right? But I'm saying that there is nearly no drawbacks. It's not like all these kids are you know, physically stunted you know, after they're older. That's not the case. Weight training as such also, there is this myth that if you start weight training, your height reduces. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's actually a big myth. The, 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 where it came from, you see, in, in your body, on your bones, you have these plates called epiphyseal plates. These are the growth plates. Right? That's where the growth happens. If you hurt yourself and you cause injury to that plate, then that bone may not grow. May not grow. So that somehow, like all these myths in fitness happen, is like you put a weight overhead, you will become short. That's how we have learned it, right? So we're always thinking that we have to wait till you're fully grown before you start weightlifting. Mm -hmm. right? exactly. But that's not true at all. But what is important is you train using good technique. There is, there is no two ways about it. Right? Because, <laughs> see, good technique is about using the right muscles to do the right work. Right? As simple as that. So you need to learn how to do it. So someone has to teach the kid how to do it. And this is where coaching comes in. Right? So uh, 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 usually, how, how good a workout is, is defined by how exhausting it is. Well, right? mm -hmm. See, but anyone, anyone can, can make, make you tired. tired. Right? Just moving your hands up and down, hands and legs till you're getting tired, that's not exercise, that's not training. That's just getting tired, that's it. Proper exercise is something that has a plan that will help you progress. It's not about exhaustion, but it is about betterment. And betterment is applicable to someone with any age. Can a seven-year-old become better? Absolutely. Can a 70-year-old become better? Absolutely. So you just need to use the right programs, the right tools for the right people. So if you're working with the right coach, any age is fine. Um, the quad, uh, what is the young, who's, have you come across anyone? Yeah, yeah, I mean, or very old? absolutely. I mean, we have... Interesting story you have. Af of course, yeah. See, um, what's interesting though is when we started the quad, uh, when we had a 50-year-old join us, it was like, whoa, you're 50 years old and you're in fitness. Today, you have so many 50-year-olds, you know, doing fitness. So it's, it's, it's like fashion, right? It changes, right? It's just perspective. At the quad, we have kids as young as 8, 9 years old training with us. Oh. And they've started as 8, 9 and been training with us till they're 15, 16, right? I mean, and it's fascinating because in that age, they, they grow every day, yeah. right? Like, I mean, when, when I say grow every day, for the child also, suddenly your hand is longer and your legs are longer, right? Proprioception is all over the place, right? So it's very interesting working with them. And I think our oldest student is um, 78, wow. I think. Um, and he's, he's superb. And the number of women we have at the age of, you know, 55, 60, 65 is, is so much. And this is really inspiring. Right? This is really inspiring because at the age of 60, 65, someone who's never done any exercise shows up as a, at a plate like the quad, picks up kettlebells, does swings, does overhead work, and in three months you see them, see them moving like, you know, like they're dancing to music, it's wonderful. Right? And, and um, stories around this, so many. Right? Because with kids, um, it's, it's a very different kind of uh, relationship that you need to have. Right? And you can't, I spoke about instructions some time back, that doesn't work with kids. Right? They're not going to take instructions from you so easily. So you're going to have to work with them differently. You're going to have to set them up separately. But at the same time, if, if they are training in a class of, say, 20 people and everyone's 40 years old and this kid is 10 years old or 12 years old, it's not cool enough for them. Right? They're not going to talk to anyone. So it's, it's very different working with them. With older adults, though, it's also very different because older adults, the, the interesting the, uh, difference between kids and say, someone who's 7 and 70 is someone who's 70 knows what it is to be 40. 
right? So they go back to their days. So they think they can do these things, right? So you have to work with them differently. And just like how little kids don't take instructions, older people, people don't take instructions well either. <laughs> they like to tell you what to do. So it's important to understand these relationships, right? The expectations are different, right? Coaching is not just about getting someone to do something at whatever cost. It is about helping people understand why they need to do it, right? Figure out the communication channel and work with them in a manner that will sit well with them, right? So, it's, so that's why, to me, coaching is so exciting because, because coaching, coaching is basically teaching. teaching. And, and every time you teach, you learn something from there also. And, and, and how quickly the older adults uh, uh, progress is amazing. I mean, I'll tell you this, this one story. Um, I can't tell you his name because he's very well uh, recognized around. But he started with us in 2012, um, had done nothing you know, on the fitness side of things, you know, very much on the software side, you know, uh, very big in his, in his industry, traveling a lot, fairly unhealthy stuff. And once he started training, he obviously really got into it. Again, like I said, you're a smart person, you can figure this out. And, and this person's been training for the last 10, 12 years now. And the kind of stuff he does today, it is goals for me. And I tell him all the time, when I am 70, when I'm you know, 60, when I'm your age, if I can do the things that you're doing right now, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and it's, it's just so inspiring, you know, watching little kids or watching you know, older adults do these things. It, 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 it shows you what you could have done and it tells you what you can do in the future. It's wonderful. So I'd like to ask you about your partner, Arvind, how he has contributed to your positive growth. Well, it's a loaded question. I mean, um, see, with, um, the, the, the only reason we're doing what we're doing this today is because we're doing it together. Yeah. Okay? And uh, we have a lot of respect for each other. We have a lot of fondness for each other. We're, we're, we're friends, we're partners, right? yeah. and, and we always have been. And uh, like we tell each other this, it's never 50-50, and it's always 50-50. Right? That's how it is, and that's how it should be, in my opinion, in any partnership. At no singular point of time will you be doing equal amount of work. But the grand scheme of things, one cannot exist you know, without the other. So we, we, have, uh, we have different styles. We complement each other, right? and, and we learn from each other. I mean, we are mentors for each, each other. Um, we are very open in how we communicate with one another. So that is, that is a great strength. So Arvind has certainly helped me think very differently you know, over the years. Um, and what we have created today, Right. as a whole, as the quad, whatever it is, is, is purely because we were able to complement each other and you know, kind of work together you know, really well. So what we have in mind for the future is, is huge because what we believe as of right now is, given how things are in you know, India right now with respect to fitness mm -hmm. and given what we've done, we've just laid the foundation. We're just getting started. Right? Because the goal for both of us is to, is to essentially change people's lives in a positive way in the long term, right? And fitness is the vehicle to do that for us. And we believe fitness is a sandbox for life. So we have used that to get to this point. But now is when things are going to explode. See, fitness is an exploding market. More and more and more people are going to get into fitness. So all that we've done over the last 10 to 12, 13 years is basically learning. And if we were able to create this starting with nothing, now with all this, we should be able to be a lot more useful to people. So the two of us, we are always thinking about how we can basically reach more people, how we can make a positive impact, how we can cut through the you know, nonsense that's out there. So hopefully we'll be able to do it. But um, if there's w one thing I'd like to say, none of this can happen alone. It, yeah, it, it, it absolutely needs one more person. Like they say, you know, self-doubt is very important and that's what we are to each, you know, each of us. And in fact, we love it when we disagree. Right? We, we say that every time because if, if we just agree, then we're not thinking, oh, great, you know, this is great, that's great, let's just move on. But the moment there's a disagreement, the way we view it is, huh, there's someone else who's thinking differently. Now, there's probably another angle to it. Let's try and explore that. So it's been an incredible journey right, with Arvind. Um, but like I said, we're just getting started. We have decades to go. We would like to know about your future plans. Are you looking at expanding it to other cities in India? Uh, future, so firstly, before we talk about the future of the quad, the future of fitness as such, right, is, is, is very interesting. Now, um, over the next 10 to 20 years, we predict that there are going to be literally millions and millions of people getting started with fitness, right? because it's not 
a choice anymore, it's a necessity. It, uh, especially after the pandemic. The post-pandemic world is a very different world where everything is delivered to you, okay? Everything, food, movies, yeah. right? Entertainment, everything is delivered to you. You literally don't have a reason to walk anymore. Right? So you have to do something to take care of fitness. And we believe that the future of fitness is you're gonna have to kind of de-sexify fitness. Okay? Today's fitness is too sexy. And what I mean by that is, um, fitness is for fit people, is that secret hidden message. Right? You look at every equipment that's being created, every new training program, every ad, every model, right? and especially every fitness related clothing that's out there. Right? If you are fit, you can flaunt it, right? and fitness is becoming a flex. It's like how you, people used to wear Rolex watches or see my car, see my house kind of thing. Now it's like see my body, right? See how, how lean I've become, right? And this whole Ozempic craze and all that is kind of, you know, playing into it. It's becoming a status symbol. And it's okay. It's a, it's a part of, you know, every revolution, so to speak, where it goes up and down. But eventually, we need to get to a point where fitness is just something that you do. See, fitness today is about looks more than anything else, right? You look at someone and like, huh, you look fit. That's what everyone wants to hear, right? It's about that. But in reality, fitness is about looking, feeling, and functioning better. It's about functionality, right? So we will reach a stage where people wake up in the morning, do something for fitness, and move on. Right? So, I mean, these are all phases, right? If you think about it about 20 years ago, people would meet, say, at the, um, at the gym in the morning, and they'd talk about how much they got drunk the previous night. Be like, oh, I had this, I had 15 drinks, or whatever. Today, we're at a stage where people meet at the bar and they talk about what they did at the gym. Like, oh, you know about this workout, man? It killed me, right? I mean, it's, it's nice to say that. It's a, it's a symbol, it's a status symbol, right? But slowly, we'll get to a point where we don't talk about it. It's just something that everyone does, right? And for that, fitness firstly has to penetrate the market. It has to become accessible to everyone with respect to time, right? With respect to uh, accessibility, with respect to cost, all these things, right? Secondly, this whole sexy vibe needs to go away, right? Um, and I like, to, I like to use pizza as an example, right? Pizza in the 90s was sexy, right? Only the cool kids would eat pizza. It was expensive. In fact, you, you can even remember Pizza Hut and, you know, places like that. They had glass walls so you could look at it from outside, right? It was very cool, the setup, all of it. Today, you get pizza at Saranabon. <laughs> you get pizza everywhere, right? It's, it's great. You still have, you know, like, you know, very high-class pizza and you still have pizza here. So pizza is accessible to everyone, right? It's still fun, but it's not so sexy that you have to take a photo and put it up saying that you ate pizza, right? But think about fitness. Think about all the sweat, sweat selfies and the, you know, like big biceps and, you know, people putting it out there because they're making a statement. Because it is still, I am doing something that most people are not. I am proud of what I am doing. See what I'm doing. That has to change. And that is gradually changing. Right? Like people need to do fitness for functionality, not because they want to look like a movie star. Right? And that change is going to happen. Now, for that change to happen, like I said, fitness needs to become accessible to everyone. And the thing that we are focusing on and two things that we want to work on, see, one is as far as in-person centers are concerned, growth will be there. But growth is kind of limited there. You have to find the right place. Now take Bangalore, for instance. Right? People have been asking us to come to Bangalore for years. Mm -hmm. And Bangalore is a great place. We love Bangalore. We have so many people working with us virtually from Bangalore. But setting up a center in Bangalore is not simple. Right? Given the traffic and given the you know, constraints, you can't set up one center in Bangalore and say, from everywhere just show up. It's just gonna be people from that area. So similarly in every city, say Delhi, setting up an in-person center is, is crazy. Look at the smoke, right? Look at the, look at the air quality. Yeah. So it's not really gonna work, right? And we train outdoors. So, but in virtual, these constraints don't exist. Mm -hmm. And it is more accessible for people. And we've proven that results, injuries, consistency, whatever doesn't change between this and that, right? So there is a big need for people to do fitness just in a very subtle way without having to make a big deal out of it. I don't want to drive 20 minutes and drive back 20 minutes, find parking, I don't want to do all that. I just want to do something. And we spoke about everything being delivered to you to yes. your house. Yeah. Fitness also has to be delivered to you at home. Mm -hmm. And this is where virtual comes in, right? And we believe that there is a big need there. Yeah. Live virtual coaching for many, many people. Nothing specialized, nothing crazy, but most people are not getting the basic 150 minutes. Right? And that can be delivered to you. 
You know, think about movies, right? Um, there are theaters, it's a great experience, but unless you're a cinephile, or unless the movie is some amazing movie, why would you, you know, drive an hour, brave through the traffic, park, go sit there, and then come back? I can watch it on OTT. It's simpler for me, right? Same thing with the food delivery. Food is great when I go there, but I have to change, I have to drive, I have to go there, I have to order, I have to wait in line, whatever. But here, I place the order on the phone, I go take a shower and come back, food's right there. Right? And because of that, more people are ordering in. Because of that, more people are watching stuff on OTT. Right? Similarly, if you say the only way to get fit is to go to the gym, you're only going to have a small group of the population doing that. But if fitness can reach you, more and more people will consume it. So that's one thing we're certainly working on. The other thing we're working on and we, 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 we strongly believe is a need is lifestyle. Right? See, as far as we are concerned, fitness is solved. Okay, as a problem, it's solved. You just show up to class, you get fit, right? Easy. Great programming, wonderful coaches, equipment is there, all that is there. The problem though is people are not showing up, mm. right? Not all the time. Consistency is not solved yet. And to solve for consistency, you have to solve for lifestyle. If you're working late every night, if you're working till 10, then you go home. You need to be numb before you go to bed. So you're on Instagram just doom scrolling. You go to bed at one o'clock. How are you gonna wake up at six and go and train? You can do it for one day, you can do it for a week, maybe for a month, but how long can you do it? So unless you fix your lifestyle, you're not gonna be able to get all your big rocks in place. It's not enough, you just tell people, oh, you have to exercise more and eat well. That's like telling someone who's depressed, just smile, man, everything will be fine. It makes no sense. Yeah. The, the source of the problem is that our lifestyles are all over the place. You ask me about breathing. Why are people not breathing? Or in fact, why should people even think about breathing? Because lifestyle is all over the place that you don't have the time to breathe. Right? And I'm not able to take 20 minutes out of my day to breathe. Because I'm, I'm saying yes to everyone. I have things stacked one after the other. How am I going to be able to take care of myself? Right? So something on the lifestyle side is, is something that we're already working on and we'll work on more next year. Basically something to guide you through the year. You need something like a GPS because we all lose our way and we need something to nudge us back on track, right? And this, this, this system should not be just about exercise. Exercise is just a part of it, right? This has to address exercise, food quality, food quantity, everyday activity, sleep, and stress. And no one's going to be able to do all of it by themselves. You need someone to guide you through this. And this is what I work with a lot of people with right now. Because people have realized that, you know what, exercise I can do, but I'm unable to go and do it, right? I'm dropping the ball here or there. I'm constantly stressed, I'm not able to, how do I do this? And this is something that me and Arvind, and we have worked on this in our personal lives consistently. Like we track stress levels in our company every quarter, right, for everyone. And I cannot remember the last time my stress levels were more than, you know, a two on five. Mm -hmm. And that requires structure and effort and it requires saying no to a lot of things yeah. right so basically that is what we we think is the need of the hour for a lot of people not intense training not lifting hundreds of kilos but a little bit of exercise good eating sleeping well learning to manage your stress if you can do this all this compounds and then you can put in more time for exercise right you will you will be in a much better place because as far as we are concerned fitness is not about losing weight or getting ripped fitness is about betterment Right? And are you looking, feeling, and functioning better today than you did yesterday? Yeah. If we can help you do that, we're happy. So, um, what you're trying to say is that you're not looking at uh, physically being present in other cities, but probably, you know, marketing yourself such that you get virtual uh, people from all over the country. Yes, uh, yeah. it's not that we won't be in other cities. Yeah. We will do that also. Yeah. But I'm saying the need right now is for people to be delivered fitness, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so virtual is, is an option to do that. Yeah. And we're, that's what see, we are usually, when we talk about fitness, we're talking about people who are already into fitness. Yeah. And, and these people, people like going, going to gyms. Yeah. But, but this is 0.02% of the population. Of the population. Mm -hmm. Right? The majority of people who are getting into fitness are people who are intimidated by all these things. Mm -hmm. So they want to do things that are not scary, injury risk should be very low, and they want to kind of sort of do it in a place where they're not judged. Yeah. So home is a great place for them to do that. So we want to be able to help those people also. Okay. So growth will happen both virtually and physically, but virtually the scope for growth is much faster. Yeah. 
Um, you spoke about lifestyle. So you see that these days, um, technology and laptops, iPads, mm-hmm. phones. So you know, people are coming to are there people coming to you with a lot of back and neck injuries and uh, what 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 is your advice? Um, yes, I mean it's it's not injuries, it's pain, pain. right? Yeah. Because it's it's overuse related uh, yeah. uh, issues there. Um, people are aware posture is a problem. Yeah. Right, and posture is a problem because one of the main reasons posture is a problem is. Uh, throughout the day, if you take a 24 hours, right, outside of your sleep, if you take the other 17 hours of the day, we spend most of our time sitting. Mm-hmm. We sit when we drive, we sit when we work, we sit when we eat, we sit when we relax also. And every time we sit, our posture is terrible, mm-hmm. right? When we're driving, we're like this. Yeah. When we're watching TV, we're, I don't know, yeah. like that, right? <laughs> when we're working, we have no idea how it is. And postural problems start there. But because we're using devices also, mm-hmm. see, the thing to remember is devices are not bad. They are amazing, you know, technological, you know, advancements. Double-edged sword, like everything. You need to learn to use it smartly, mm-hmm. right? If you're someone who's spending time at 2 o'clock in the night in a weird posture, you know, watching reels, if that's how you're using technology and a phone, then that's a problem, yeah. right? But if you're someone who's working through your phone, who's taking advantage of the fact that, you know what, I can, like right now on, on my way back on the drive, I can still answer emails, I can still get on a call. Technology is allowing me to do that, right? So how do you use it? But at the same time, be mindful of your posture and how you, you know, yeah. how you move. That's the key. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, uh, the pain that you're talking about is also a result of weakness. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm sitting all the time. I don't do any exercise. exercise yeah. That's supposed. So my core is weak. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So naturally, when I'm working on the computer, I'm like this. I'm slouched. But someone who has more core strength will probably be able to sit yeah. up mm-hmm. a little more. Right? So it's all connected. Yeah. We are seeing more, but because we work with people on strength training, which is the foundation of fitness, this happens lesser and lesser. What is the best piece of advice you've got? Be consistent. It's, um, it's, I, I very honestly feel that is uh, the trump card, that is the magic bullet that everyone's you know, been looking for. Uh, if, you can, if you can package consistency in a bottle and sell it, it would yeah, sell like hotcakes, right? Uh, it's also the hardest thing because consistency is interesting because we are consistent <clears throat> in many aspects of our life. We are. Like, for instance, going to work. Most of us go to work consistently, right? Or uh, the, the, the things that are easier to do, we're able to be consistent. If I said you have to eat a bag of chips every day, yeah, no problem, you can do that. But we find it hard to be consistent in things like exercise, sleep, right, nutrition. And we know how to do these things. We're able to do it for one month, for two months. But can you do it for three years? Can you do it for 10 years? Right? So if you can master the art of consistency, then everything falls in place. So if you have to learn one thing, if you have to spend uh, time, money, resources focusing on something, let it be on consistency and habit building. Oh, is there any secret to uh, being consistent? Yeah, show up. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> right? And we have a, we have a t-shirt at the quad which says showing up is my yeah. superpower, right? Because if you can show up, even if it's for a minute and we spoke about parenting, we spoke about nutrition, for all of this, yeah. that's the only magic, that's the only secret, right? Whatever happens, show up. If you can plan to show up, the rest of it will take care of itself. Brilliant. Before we let you go, we'd like to know uh, some of the myths that exist in the whole fitness business and, you know, how you'd like to bust them. Sure. Do you have another 10 hours? <laughs> <laughs> Too many. Right? Too many. Too many. And, uh, um, and I feel a lot of these myths are, are, are not really, it's not like, you know, three, three people sitting in a dark room saying, let's come up with myths and fool everyone, right? It's not that. It's just misunderstanding or a period of time which gets converted to myths. Uh, if we have to name a few, uh, one myth that, that never dies is women and strength training, right? Like women get bulky when they do strength training, right? I mean, it doesn't happen, never happens unless you want it to really happen. Right? But strength training has so many benefits, health benefits. And it, being afraid of getting bulky is like, oh, I don't want to go to work. I might become like Warren Buffett. So I just don't want to become too rich, right? It's kind of like that. And so it's a myth that has to die. And more and more and more women needs to, you know, they, they have to embrace strength training. That's one. The second thing is about, let's say, nutrition. There are so many myths around nutrition and weight gain. Right? If you eat carbs, you'll get fat. If you eat uh, a big meal at night, you'd get fat. Right? If you eat any kind of junk, you'd get fat. None of that is true. The only thing that will cause you to gain weight is a calorie surplus. Right? So as long as you're not overeating, and what I mean by overeating is more than what your body needs, as long as you're at calorie maintenance or calorie deficit, there is absolutely no way for you to gain weight. 
Okay, it's like this, there's, there's water in the cup. If you want more water, you have to pour more water. It's not going to magically appear. Right? So if I'm eating the same amount of food, it doesn't matter whether I eat at 12 a.m. Uh, you know, at night or in the morning. It's calories, it's just thermodynamics, right? So as long as you are not worried about these things, you, are, you have a good balance of macros and micros, your nutrition is well on track, right? And um, the third thing I would like to talk about, let's say, regarding myth is um, sleep. You snooze, you lose, right? You only need five hours of sleep. The most successful people in the world work up, wake up at four o'clock, all this nonsense, right? I mean, it's, it's sad because sleep is one of the most fundamental things that we need. Right? You cannot function without sleep. And you are a different person with sleep and without sleep. Right. Right? Like completely different person. Right? And in fact, when uh, they did research on sleep, and we have been and we will continue to understand it, they're trying to understand why we sleep, what is the point of it. And as they started figuring things out, what they re the, the question they came up with was, why are we even awake? Because sleeping is so important. Right? Like why do we even wake up? Right? And so sleep and making sure you get your seven to eight hours of sleep is so important. Right? And we believe that staying up for longer, uh, giving up sleep and exercising, or giving up sleep and working is how we can progress. Right? But to be very honest, the fastest way to get somewhere is to slow down. Yeah? So I think that's important to take time to sleep. Thank you so much, Raj, for making the time uh, to be with us today. Both Neha and myself and all our listeners have been greatly uh, encouraged and educated by what you had to tell us. And uh, I'm sure that we will be uh, having more interactions with you and we look forward to your book. We are amazed at the kind of research you're able to put into your work and the impact you're able to have. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thank you, Thank you for Thank having so me. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you.